everyone. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the options of using Dilapan S and the Foley for cervical ripening during a medical labor induction. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about cervical ripening, the Bishop score, and some mechanical ways to ripen the cervix. This episode is going to wrap up the series we've been doing this year. We started talking about natural induction methods, focusing on one new method per month on the podcast. And then two episodes ago in episode 151, we talked about membrane stripping, which actually is a mechanical method of cervical ripening. We're going to expand on that topic in this podcast. Whenever you have a formal medical labor induction, it usually involves two steps. First, cervical ripening is done to physically soften and eventually thin and dilate the cervix in preparation for labor and vaginal birth. Second, when the cervix is favorable, labor induction stimulates uterine contractions artificially to promote the start of labor. Clinicians often use the Bishop score to determine if cervical ripening is beneficial before an induction. The Bishop score is based on results from a vaginal exam that uses five measurements to determine the readiness of the cervix for labor, which sometimes people call cervical ripeness. Cervical dilation is the measure of how dilated or open the cervix is in centimeters. You can get anywhere from zero to three points for the dilation of your cervix. Cervical effacement is the percentage of how effaced or thin the cervix is. 0% means the cervix is normal pre-labor, and 100% effaced means the cervix is paper thin and very ready to go into labor. Again, just with like dilation, with the Bishop score, you get anywhere from 0 to 3 points for cervical effacement. Next, fetal station is a measure of how far the fetal head has descended into the birth canal. Negative numbers mean the baby is floating above the pelvis. Zero station means the baby is fully engaged in the pelvis. And positive numbers mean the baby is crowning and beginning to emerge from the birth canal. Again, you can get anywhere from zero to three points for fetal station. Next, cervical position refers to the position of the cervix relative to the pelvis and the fetal head. When it is favorable for labor, the cervical position changes from posterior toward the back to anterior toward the front and you can get anywhere from zero to two points for the position of the cervix. Finally, you measure cervical consistency, how the cervix feels. A firm cervix feels like the tip of the nose and a soft, ripened cervix feels more like the lips. You can get anywhere from zero to two points for the consistency of the cervix. All of these subscores are added up to get the total Bishop score. If the total Bishop score is higher than eight, then the chance of having a vaginal birth with a medical labor induction is very good, similar to the chance of having a vaginal birth after a labor that starts on its own or spontaneously. A score of six or less means that the cervix is unfavorable for induction and that cervical ripening methods should be considered to increase the chance of having a vaginal birth with your induction. A Bishop score of seven is not clearly favorable or unfavorable for induction. We reviewed the research on this subject, and we found many studies that show that higher Bishop scores are linked to a higher chance of vaginal birth with induction, and lower scores are linked to a higher chance of cesarean if you have an induction. However, the Bishop score is still not considered a super great predictor of success or having a vaginal birth with an induction, especially if you have a middle range score of four, five, or six. There is something called a simplified Bishop score, The simplified Bishop score uses only dilation, effacement, and station, and research shows that it appears to be as good as the original Bishop score at predicting a vaginal birth with induction. Using these three components, a score of more than five is considered favorable for induction. A major limitation of the Bishop score is that it does not consider whether someone has given birth before, and having a prior vaginal birth has been found to be a very important factor perhaps the most important factor in predicting whether or not an induction will be successful. Some researchers have proposed modifying the Bishop score to add points for people who have already had at least one vaginal birth in the past. However, despite its limitations, the Bishop score is still useful in helping to decide whether cervical ripening is beneficial before induction.
If you want to calculate your own Bishop score, it can be helpful to ask your provider at your appointment if you choose to accept a vaginal exam what your Bishop score is as you're nearing term. Especially if your provider is recommending an induction, it's always a good idea to ask, what's my Bishop score? If your Bishop score is low, you will likely need cervical ripening before you have an induction. You can also look up Bishop score calculators online. Just Google Bishop score calculator and any number of versions will pop up and they're all virtually the same. So many people before they go in for an induction or when they arrive for an induction do have to undergo medical cervical ripening first. Medical cervical ripening methods can be divided into mechanical and pharmacologic or drug-based methods that can be used alone or in combination. And for the rest of this podcast, we're going to focus solely on mechanical methods of cervical ripening. I did want to let you know that in a few weeks, we are releasing a brand new pocket guide all about the evidence on labor induction. We're going to cover all of the evidence on the reasons for labor induction, the medical and mechanical and pharmacological ways of inducing labor, as well as natural methods of inducing labor. So in this podcast, I'm focusing just on the mechanical methods, but we do cover the medications that are used to ripen the cervix and induce labor in our new pocket guide. If you want to get on the list for the pocket guide, the wait list, just go to evidencebasedbirth.com slash wait list. We will be doing a limited printing run of our pocket guides at the end of November. So make sure you're on the wait list if you want to get your hands on one of the pocket guides. All right, so mechanical methods of cervical ripening. Mechanical methods are drug-free methods that involve the use of hands or medical devices to promote labor. A few weeks ago in episode 151, we talked about membrane sweeping, which is also referred to as membrane stripping or the stretch and sweep of the membranes. That involves inserting one or two gloved fingers into the vagina and through the cervix, and then using a continuous circular sweeping motion to gently separate the bag of water that surrounds the baby from the lower part of the uterus. This procedure is done to increase your body's natural release of hormones that contribute to cervical ripening. And we covered all of the evidence on the pros and cons of membrane sweeping in episode 151. So I won't go over it anymore in this episode. Another mechanical method to ripen the cervix is something called cervical osmotic dilators. And these are thin rods that are inserted into the vagina and through the opening of the cervix. To use cervical osmotic dilators, the cervix must be at least partially dilated, about one centimeter at least. Usually, several rods are inserted together. The rods absorb water from the surrounding tissue which causes them to gradually swell and stretch the cervix. Laminaria is made from sterile dried seaweed and dilapan is made from a synthetic gel material. Laminaria has been used in the United States since 1869, but was withdrawn from the market because of an increased risk of infection. It was reintroduced in the 1970s when new sterilization techniques became available to make the laminaria rods sterile but it was largely replaced by synthetic dilapan dilators in the early 1980s. The synthetic dilators have the advantage of assured sterility, a softer and more uniform shape, superior dilating properties, and they avoid the risk of allergic reaction that can occur with laminaria. The U.S. FDA approved the use of something called dilapan-S. S S stands for super version. In 2015 for cervical ripening, The new version was made with stronger material than the original Dilapan. Dilapan S has been on the market for 21 years and is used in 41 countries, and it can be used both outpatient and inpatient. Another method of mechanical cervical ripening is using a balloon catheter. Balloon catheters are actually the most common form of mechanical cervical ripening when you go in for a formal medical induction. The single balloon catheter, called a Foley catheter, F-O-L-E-Y, is a small sterile rubber tubing that is inserted into the vagina and through the opening of the cervix. To use this method, the cervix must be at least partially dilated, at least one centimeter dilated. After the sterile tubing is passed through the opening of the cervix into the uterus, a single balloon is inflated with sterile fluid, causing the balloon to press down gently on the cervix from the inside, and 
and causing a physical stretching of the cervix. The pressure of the balloon on top of the cervix also stimulates the release of natural hormones that promote cervical ripening. The catheter can be taped to the pregnant person's legs so that it is kept under tension. Research has found potential benefits to the outpatient use of Foley balloon catheters. You might also be interested to know that there is also a double balloon catheter called the Cook or a TAD catheter. But researchers have found that the double balloon catheter is no more effective than the single balloon Foley catheter, and the double balloon catheter reportedly causes people more discomfort. The U.S. FDA has approved the double balloon catheter for labor induction, while the single balloon catheter is used off-label. Another mechanical method that I'm not really going to go into is amniotomy, which is the artificial rupture of membranes, also called artificially breaking the water. Breaking the water could theoretically help ripen the cervix because it's linked to the release of chemicals and hormones that stimulate contractions, but more often it's actually used in trying to induce labor with contractions not necessarily to ripen the cervix. So we won't cover amniotomy in this episode. However, it is covered in the pocket guide on labor induction. At this point though, you might be wondering, why would we even want to use mechanical methods of cervical ripening if there are medications available? And there are several medications on the market that can be used to ripen the cervix. I cover those medication methods in detail in the pocket guide on induction that we're releasing soon. Well, the reason mechanical methods are still quite popular is because they are a drug-free method. They involve the use of hands or medical devices, but because you're not giving someone a systemic medication, they have less risk of something called hyperstimulation. Hyperstimulation of the uterus is a broad term that includes something called tachycystole, which is when you have more than five contractions in 10 minutes, averaged over 30 minutes. Tachycystole and excessive uterine activity can lower oxygen levels to the fetus and lead to fetal distress. So because mechanical methods have a much lower risk of hyperstimulation, they tend to be pretty popular methods for ripening the cervix. Of course, the problem is with the laminaria, the dilapan S, and the Foley bulb catheter, You really need to be about one centimeter dilated before any of those methods can be used to ripen the cervix, so they might not be available to everyone. So now I want to take you deeper into the evidence on two of these topics, the cervical osmotic dilators and the Foley catheter. So let's talk about the cervical osmotic dilators. And in general, when I'm talking about those, I'm going to be talking about the Dilapan S, which are those sterile rods that you put in the cervix that swell and help dilate the cervix. The information we have on the effectiveness of cervical osmotic dilators comes from a randomized trial as well as a prospective multi-center study. In the randomized trial on Dilapan S, there were 419 U.S. participants who had either Dilapan S or the Foley balloon for cervical ripening. To be in this study, everyone was at least 37 weeks pregnant and scheduled for an induction with an unripe cervix. People were excluded from the randomized trial if they had ruptured membranes, infection, a prior uterine scar, vaginal bleeding, a suspected big baby, or if they required immediate delivery. The study included both first-time mothers and experienced mothers. Everyone received continuous monitoring for 20 minutes before the device was placed, either the Dilopan S or the Foley. As many Dilopan S rods as would fit were placed in the cervical canal, and those who had a Foley balloon had it inflated with 60 milliliters of saline. Study participants remained at the hospital but were able to walk around, shower, and perform normal activities. If the assigned dilator was still in place after 12 hours and the cervix remained unripe, then the dilator was used for another round of 12 hours. The researchers found a trend towards more vaginal birth with Dilapan S compared to the Foley balloon, 81% versus 76%. But this difference was not large enough to conclude definitively that Dilapan S is a better option than Foley. However, the study authors did say that Dilapan S is at least an equally good option, And the safety outcomes during cervical ripening were similar for people who had either Dilapan S or Foley, and there were no differences in other birth outcomes between the groups. Even though the device remained in place longer on average, the pregnant people assigned to Dilapan S reported that they were significantly more satisfied than those assigned to Foley as far as sleep, their ability to relax, 
and their ability to perform daily activities. Next, a prospective multi-center study analyzed data from 444 participants in seven countries who used synthetic osmotic dilators for labor induction. Everyone was between 37 and 42 weeks of pregnancy, and about 65% were giving birth for the first time, and 35% had given birth before, including over 9% of people with one prior cesarean. The average baseline Bishop score was 2.9, and this increased to 6.5 after using Dilopan S for cervical ripening. Three to four dilator rods were used on average. The overall rate of vaginal birth after Dilopan S was 70%. However, the vaginal birth rate was higher, 77%, among the 188 participants who used the device for less than 12 hours. Only about 10% of people went into labor on their own after cervical ripening with Dilopan S. In other words, most people had to use other methods of induction after they concluded cervical ripening with Dilopan S. So the device is not used to avoid an induction, but rather to improve the chance of vaginal birth with an induction. The authors found Dilopan S to be safe and effective for cervical ripening, including among people with prior cesareans. There were no bad newborn outcomes from the use of Dilopan S. A few people experienced complications from the device, such as bleeding during insertion or removal, 2.7%, and cramping or pain, 0.2%. And there were no infections linked to the use of Dilopan S. So to sum up the advantages and disadvantages of Dilopan S, the advantages are that this is a drug-free method of cervical ripening that has a similar effectiveness to the Foley balloon. Unlike medications, Dilopan S does not cause systemic or whole body side effects, and it's less likely to cause strong uterine contractions while the cervix is ripening. It's not contraindicated for people with a prior cesarean. If you've had a cesarean in the past, there's a lot of medication methods that might not be appropriate options for you because of the increased risk of uterine rupture. So it is something that somebody with a prior cesarean could use for cervical ripening. It's also well-suited to the outpatient setting or in countries or locations with limited access to fetal monitoring. Once you have the rods inserted, it's possible to use the toilet, shower, walk around, sleep, and perform activities as normal. It can be removed, so there's a potential for reversibility if you changed your mind about using it. And some pregnant people have reported higher satisfaction levels with Dilopan S compared to using the Foley. Also, unlike the Foley balloon, Dilopan S does not protrude from the vagina. It remains mostly in the cervical canal, so there's no need to have something taped to your leg. The disadvantages of Dilopan S are that it's not commonly used in many birth settings, so providers might not be familiar with this alternative to the Foley for mechanical cervical ripening. The procedure requires a vaginal exam to assess cervical ripeness and a period of in-person monitoring before and after device placement. You may go on to still require medications to ripen the cervix if the cervix is not dilated enough to insert the rods. You may have pain or discomfort with the procedure, and there is a low risk of potential bleeding from inserting or extracting the rods. Dilopan S has not been well studied among people with ruptured membranes, so if your water is already broken, there isn't research really on that. And it cannot be used if there is a low-lying placenta or any kind of infection in the genital tract. In terms of practice guidelines and what they have to say about Dilopan S, Dilopan S is not specifically mentioned in practice guidelines for induction. However, in the United States, ACOG recommends, in general, osmotic dilators as effective in ripening the cervix for labor. In preparing to record this podcast and create our pocket diet on induction, Anna Bertoni from our research team attended an interesting seminar on Dilopan S taught by Dr. Saad, S-A-A-D, the lead United States researcher on this topic. It's a great opportunity to ask questions and learn more, especially if you're a healthcare provider in this area and you want to learn more about cervical osmotic dilators. So if you want to register for an upcoming seminar, I will put in the show notes the email address of the person that you can email to ask about seminars with Dr. Saad. So now let's talk about the balloon catheters and their effectiveness for ripening the cervix. When we look at the research on the effectiveness of balloon catheters, most studies used a 16 to 20 French Foley catheter and inflate it with anywhere from 30 to 80 milliliters of sterile fluid. When randomized trials have been combined into a meta-analysis, 
Researchers have found a shorter time to birth by about two hours with an increased inflation volume of 60 milliliters versus 30 milliliters. Interestingly, there is no evidence of benefit from using a double balloon over a single slash Foley balloon. And the single balloon is reported to be safer and less painful, even though it's the double balloon that is FDA approved. In looking at the research on the Foley balloon, which is the single balloon, compared with placebo, a sham treatment, the Foley catheter improved the odds of a vaginal birth within 24 hours and lowered the risk of cesarean. Compared with a medication called dinoprostone, which is inserted vaginally, the balloon catheter was just as effective as the medication at resulting in vaginal birth within 24 hours, and there was no difference in the risk of cesarean. Compared to the medication dinoprostone, the balloon catheter is safer for babies on a number of outcomes, including uterine tachycystole or hypersystole, which is a contraction that lasts at least two minutes with fetal heart rate changes. The balloon catheter was also safer in terms of lower rates of cesareans for fetal distress and serious newborn health complications or death. Pregnant people who were randomly assigned to the balloon were more satisfied with their birth experience compared to those who were assigned to the medication of vaginal dinoprostone. Researchers think that the benefits of the Foley balloon over vaginal dinoprostone are so clear that no more research on this comparison is necessary. The Foley balloon is better than dinoprostone, the medication, hands down. When the researchers compared the Foley balloon to intracervical dinoprostone, the balloon led to less fetal distress with no difference in effectiveness. Compared to a different medication called low-dose vaginal misoprostol, the balloon might not be quite as effective because there was a lower risk of cesarean with a low-dose vaginal misoprostol. However, the balloon was safer for the baby, lowering the risk of uterine tachycystole or hypersystole with fetal heart rate changes, as well as lowering the risk of meconium stained fluid. Compared to low-dose oral misoprostol, where the medication misoprostol is taken by mouth, the balloon may be slightly less effective as there was a lower rate of vaginal birth within 24 hours with the balloon. There's not enough research yet to know if the balloon has better outcomes than oral misoprostol low dose in terms of uterine tachycystole, hypersystole, serious complications, or death. In some research studies, pregnant people have reported higher satisfaction with oral misoprostol compared to the balloon. Two recent meta-analyses of randomized trials have compared outpatient to inpatient use of the balloon catheter and found that outpatient use is safe and effective. Compared to having to be hospitalized, People who had the Foley balloon outpatient had significantly lower cesarean rates, a shorter length of hospital stay, and a more favorable increase in Bishop score. With outpatient use, there was a shorter time from placing the balloon catheter to birth, over five hours shorter on average, compared to people who were inpatients and were hospitalized for the procedure. Studies have not found an increased risk of infection when the balloon catheter is used among people with intact membranes, meaning your water has not broken yet. However, recent evidence suggests a possible increased risk of maternal infection when the Foley is used among people who have already had their water broken or have ruptured membranes. So to sum up the advantages and disadvantages of the Foley balloon, the advantages are that it increases the rate of vaginal birth within 24 hours compared to sham treatment, and it has similar effectiveness in terms of cervical ripening as the medication dinoprostone. However, there is a lower risk of uterine hyperstimulation, which can lead to fetal distress compared to using synthetic prostaglandins. So the Foley balloon is safer for the baby than using medications. Unlike medications, the balloon catheter does not cause systemic side effects, and it's less likely to cause strong uterine contractions while the cervix is ripening. So far, it's not been contraindicated for people with a prior cesarean. So it is an option for cervical ripening for someone who's had a prior cesarean. It's also well suited to the outpatient setting or in countries with limited access to fetal monitoring. Once you have the Foley inserted, it's possible to use the toilet, shower, walk around, or sleep, although there may be a tube coming out of the vagina that is taped to the thigh for tension. The Foley can be removed, so there's the potential for reversibility if you change your mind. It's widely available and relatively simple to use, and it's stable at room temperature and low cost. The disadvantages of the Foley are that it may be less effective than the medication misoprostol, 
and it's less effective alone versus combined with other methods of induction. The procedure requires a vaginal exam to assess cervical ripeness and a period of in-person monitoring before and after device placement. If you are not around one centimeter dilated when it's inserted, you might need to have medications to ripen your cervix first. Some people complain of pain or discomfort with the insertion procedure, and some people may have bleeding after the procedure. There also may be an increased risk of maternal infection if it's used in someone who has ruptured membranes. And the Foley should not be used when there is a low-lying placenta or a genital tract infection. In looking at the practice guidelines from the United States and Canada, in the United States, ACOG states that the Foley catheter is a reasonable and effective alternative for cervical ripening and inducing labor, based on good and consistent scientific evidence. In Canada, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada recommends Foley catheters as acceptable and safe, including for use with vaginal birth after cesarean and in the outpatient setting. So that concludes the info on this podcast episode all about mechanical methods for ripening the cervix. I hope you found this information helpful. It was super interesting for our research team to look at the research on these methods because they're not really something we've ever covered before at the evidence-based birth blog or podcast. In summary, we've covered the concept of cervical ripening, the Bishop score, and the mechanical methods of cervical osmotic dilators, including Dilapan S, and using the Foley balloon for cervical ripening. Mechanical methods do have advantages over medication methods and that they're less likely to cause hyperstimulation of the uterus or tachycystole. However, there are some situations where the mechanical methods cannot be used, such as if you have a completely closed cervix. If you want to learn more about the medication methods of cervical ripening, I'd encourage you to get on the waitlist for our pocket guide. Just go to evidencebasedbirth.com slash waitlist to be among the first to find out when the pocket guide is available for order. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next time. Bye. 